Welcome, everybody. This is Hugh Massey, the CEO and founder of DNA Behaviour. And today I'm delighted to be hosting another identity conversation. And I've got with me my great friend, EO, uh, forum mate from, from the past. And, and we've had a long relationship, uh, Brandon Lisi. And Brandon is the, the founder of Object Nine, which is a marketing and branding agency, but also an exciting endeavor that he's developed in, in, in the last couple of years is uh, he's been building out Rocket Fizz as a, as a franchise business for himself and something he's super passionate about. So welcome, Brandon. Well, thank you for having me on your show. No, that's a pleasure. So Brandon, why don't you just tell, tell the audience, our listeners, a little bit about your life background, how you got to starting Object 9 and then to, to Rocket Fizz. Well, in the late 80s, early 90s, I was a chemistry major with a jazz music minor, so clearly conflicted right out of the gate, right? And I did an internship at uh, one of the big chemical plants and realized that I was the one that didn't belong. And uh, while I enjoyed a lot of the aspects of chemistry from an academic and an abstract creative perspective, and it really is an engaging subject matter, I just did not see myself fitting in into the culture of a, an organization like at Exxon or Chevron or whatever it might be. And, and I was having a lot more fun playing music and, and, and living the lifestyle of, you know, a person uh, playing music and working and whatnot. And I got a job in marketing and found out I really liked that. And so I just decided I was going to quit my senior year of college and just pursue some other things because I realized by following that path, I was going to end up being very unhappy. And uh, my best friend from college called me up one day in late 91 and said, hey, I have an idea for a job or a new company. And uh, five months later, he was living on my couch and we started Object 9 together. And uh, we've been business partners for 29 years now. No, that's fantastic. So, and that's John, isn't it? Yes, my partner, John Cato. And uh, back in 2018, um, you know, we had been doing the marketing thing, the agency uh, thing for quite a long time. And uh, he actually saw the, uh, there was an episode on My Undercover Boss where they profiled Rocket Fizz. And he thought it was a really interesting business model. And, you know, we're both dads, you know, we spoil our kids, we, you know, love our kids, we dote on them and whatnot. And, you know, Candy store seemed like a really fun concept and a fun thing to work on creatively. And he pitched me on the idea of doing it together in 2018. And I thought it would be a fun business where, you know, you just basically the whole purpose of it is to make people happy. You know, it's not to solve their marketing problems or, you know, engineer value across the corporate chain or whatever it might be. It was just create a place that makes people happy. When they walk in, they smile. And so uh, did a lot of scouting and found a location and opened the store in 2019. And it started making money immediately. It was a lot of fun to do. And... We've had a good run over the last couple of years. As you know, I've been dealing with some healthcare issues, sort of slowed yeah. the roll on doing some additional stores. But now that I feel like a lot of that stuff's behind me, we're looking at opening up another location and kind of get back into planting our candy orchard, which is what we call it. And uh, it's something that provides a lot of joy for both of us. I, I've, Brandon, you know, we had breakfast last week. I've never seen you smile more than when you talk about rocket fears and, and making people happy. And it made me leave breakfast on, on, on cloud nine. I, I, I have to say that I never felt happier uh, for you and just seeing you so jazzed up about something and, 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 and driven to make it succeed. Yeah. I didn't even give you any candy. You were just. <laughs> no, you gave me all the candy yeah. that I needed in. Little mental candy. Yeah. Mental candy, uh, which is often all I need. Um, just gave you the mental candy candy in in just seeing how you felt about it. And, you know, so I think that's that's really exciting. But bringing it back to me, I suppose me being practical in terms of 
you know, you and John working together in Object Nine, and now you've built Rocket Fears. But you know, what's your standout talent? Because you've built now a couple of successful businesses, and and made them work. And and you know, you're you're a great marketer, brander, idea person problem solver, um, visionary. So, you know, just tell me a little bit more uh, about that. Well, I think, you know, when I did the DNA behavior um, profile with you years ago, um, one of the, I guess, the standout metric was creativity, right? That was the yeah. one that, because you're the one who interpreted it and came back and, and talked about where I fit in the percentiles and whatnot. And, you know, I've always felt like, like my partner and the people around me and my company are, I, I think, a lot more creative than I am. Where, I, where I'm good is creative collaboration. Like, I'm real, I think I'm, I've got a good eye for talent. I, I can tell when somebody is smart and talented and creative. And I feel like I'm a good creative improvisational sounding board for other people. Cause I, I have enough experience now where I can kind of get a sense of what will work and what will not work. And also to kind of help keep things focused on the objective. Yeah. Whatever that might, that objective might be. So I think my greatest talent is as that creative collaborator and, and being able to talk with people and kind of get out of them their best ideas and their thoughts and synthesizing that. So you know, I was a little surprised that creativity was so high because I always felt like I'm probably a little bit better on the sort of synthesizing and relating, you know, sort of relational concept level as opposed to just pure creativity. But, but I think some of that comes out, you know, when I, when I started doing the candy store, I also realized that, through the years, I wouldn't say I ever learned how to do it, you know, in a formal way, but my ability to identify people that fit within the culture and identifying talent that would fit within a culture, I think I've gotten pretty good at that. Yeah. And it wasn't something that I necessarily set out to do at the beginning of my career. In fact, when I joined EO, I think one of the biggest problems I had is I didn't have a good hiring process. And one of the more transformational moments for me in EO was uh, I attended a Brad Smart seminar and kind of got exposed to top grading and understanding that methodology. And while the original version was a little overkill for my company, having a strategy for identifying and interviewing people gave me a lot of confidence. Yeah. And I took that confidence and that knowledge and that process and layered it on top of, of a natural ability to be able, like if you can riff with me or be creative with me. I think you're, you know, you're good. Uh, not that I'm great, but uh, you, you know, you're at least at a base level. Cause I feel like I'm at a base level. That's I'm good. I can, I can do this stuff. And so I've been able to find people who are better than me. And that's kind of been, I think you've heard this before. My whole goal is to be the worst employee in the company, right? I just, I want to be the baseline because I think if you have the work ethic and the passion and enthusiasm, plus you're creative in terms of how to take ownership of whatever it is that you, you know, you're, you're taking ownership of, you're going to be successful. And by doing, by being successful at your job, you'll be successful. You know, I'll be successful because I, I feel like that's my whole job is to lift people up and empower them and, and help them be successful. Yeah, I think that's a uh, that's an interesting segue because I think there's lots of uh, levels and, and uh, levels of creativity, and it comes out in lots of lots of forms. And I think just to look at it in isolation, creativity in isolation may not be enough, Brandon. In that you know, and and for our listeners' benefit, you're an initiator style person, and comes with that is sort of what I call the take charge factor or style where where you want to lead and to some degree be the be the influencer um with with the ideas and i think the inf what i've seen is the influencer in the conversation um you know and i think you were sort of alluding to that before well, does that seem right you know because you like to guide people in the conversation which is perhaps where the collab you know the creative collaboration is coming out 
I do. And, and it's sometimes, you know, I think when I was younger, I was more inclined to guide them to a predetermined end. Yeah. Um, as I've gotten older and I think wiser, I think I'm better at getting it started without the, with, without the destination in mind all the time and allowing the other people to find an even better destination. And that's been, you know, sort of a change from being prescriptive in the way I guide things versus being a little bit more flexible in the way I guide things. And I think, you know, another big takeaway from the self-analysis that I did with you in the DNA process is that it's okay not to be the sustainer. Yeah. You know, and, and there was a sense of sort of internal obligation that, you know, not only can I, do I have to start this thing, I've got to maintain it. And I, I'm not strong at maintaining things for a long period of time because my curiosity, which is, you know, another kind of trait, I don't know if this thing sometimes, you know, I'm always looking for something else and kind of always wanting to look around the corner and see other ideas and explore other things. And so it's been, you know, where I feel like my strength in identifying talent has come in through the years is really trying to find those people that complement uh, me and, and be more the integrators or the, the people who can sustain things systemically. And, you know, even the creativity, I, I'm, I'm interested in creating the outcome. I struggle with creating the processes that realize the outcome. Yeah. That, I think that's a skill set that I've, I have, I've begun to get better at, but I still struggle with because I want to improvise as opposed to, you know, we're going to play the same music the same way every time. It kind of goes back to the jazz is like, I just want to know the theme and improvise on the theme. I'm not interested in playing it the same way every single time. And so that's a bit of a weakness in me as a business operator where I've really had to focus on finding people who are much more disciplined. Like my partner, John is, much more disciplined thinker. Uh, and he's a lot more, I always thought a lot more creative than I am, but he's also a lot more disciplined in terms of how to operationalize things because he's got, he's the guy who's always had to kind of make the marketing come to life with the team. Right. So he, he's been more the integrator in, in our partnership, I think. Well, every, you know, I think every successful partnership needs a visionary, someone to, to, to define the goal, define the vision, set the goals and lead that part of it. And, you know, definitely in your style, Brandon, that's there. But, you know, you just mentioned the, uh, the improvisation. While you might think that's a weakness, it's actually a, it's one of your greatest strengths as well, is the ability to imp improvise and be highly intuitive. And I, I, I've seen that as we've gone along. Um, your intuition is very strong. Um, but coming with that means that you're not going to want to do all the integration work. That's actually going to be stressful. Oh, it's extremely stressful. It's, it's mentally uh, stressful for me. And I think it's to a certain degree, I'm, I'm going to give my partner credit because I think he's, you know, just as visionary. I think he's, he's, he and I have the same personality types, actually. I think he's an initiator as well. And when we do strength finders and whatnot, we're very similar, but he's been able to kind of, you know, we both sort of met in the middle in terms of figuring out how to integrate stuff. And I think because he he's more of the craftsman in terms of understanding how to build what we build in, in the marketing uh, world, he's definitely, you know, been an extraordinarily important partner for me. Um, and he's somebody I, I've learned a lot of things from, but when it gets down into setting up inventory systems in a candy store. It's like, no, you know, just shoot me in the head. I don't want to deal with that. But the, the, I've been able to find people that have that process and, you know, giving you a little bit of a plug. I, I lean on the DNA methodologies in terms of trying to at least give me a mathematical edge yeah. to build on the intuition because I, you know, I, I have been fortunate in, you know, one of my old former mates, Steve Gallo, said I have a highly developed spidey sense, right, uh, about people and situations. But as I've gotten older, I, I gain a lot more comfort in having some mathematical backup, you know, on the intuition and, and more 
systemic approaches to identifying that talent and categorizing that and also learning how to work with it. Because I think that was one of the beautiful things I got from our collaboration was figuring out how to work with other people that have different personality types. I mean, I think having a very strong intuition like you've got, ability to improvise, be spontaneous, is an extreme strength. It's a gift, Brandon. And using a system like ours, it, it provides some data. It, it can tell you that someone's relatively more structured. Okay, that's good. We need someone like that. If they're creative enough to keep up with you and John, that's that's great. But I wouldn't underestimate the intuition. And you know, maybe if we bring that across to to Rocket Fizz, surely. But, you know, jumping on rocket fears, and in a way, you just knew that was right. Is it? Am I? Am I uh, right about that? And and finding the sites. Um, well, I had you know in the past, of we had done a fair amount of economic development work. Um, there was you know that's a fun kind of puzzle to solve when you're working with a community and doing economic development work. So I think I had a pretty good grounding in the sort of the methodology of finding a site uh, until you do it and you prove that, you, you know, what you, the theory, right, uh, becomes practice, you don't know. But I had a, you know, the thing that was really intriguing to me, you know, there's sort of two levels. Number one, going from the professional services firm model where it's big engagements and big numbers and big solutions and problems to a penny nickel dime kind of business, right? Where raising the price 10 cents on a Coke matters to the bottom line. It's just, it was, it was an interesting, different kind of creative problem to solve. And it was a different kind of employee to pursue, right? Trying to hire a different kind of person. So it was, it was a fun and different kind of creative problem to, to, to work on. But it was also, and I think this is more important and kind of gets to, I think what's, what led to us talking today is I got in, I could see the why of this, right? It, yeah. I can just make people happy. And, you know, whether it's the scouting work that I do, you know, I work so hard as a scout leader, not for accolades or patches or awards, because I want to see kids smile. I want to give them unbelievably amazing, memorable experiences that they will savor throughout their life. And hopefully one day when they're a dad or a mom in some cases, they're going to look back on that and want to reproduce that joy of discovery and experience for their kids. And so it's a little bit of a leaving a legacy of happiness in a, in a, on one level, but it's also just a real simple thing. I have a candy store come on in here and discover something that you didn't know was in here and smile while you enjoy it, right? It, you don't get that same kind of experience doing marketing work for people. You know, <laughs> it's a very intuitive, visceral kind of immediate sense of joy. And it's a very easy why, you know, it, selling the, vision to your employees is very simple. It's like, we're not here selling candy. We're selling an experience. We're here to yeah. create a memorable, joyful experience for this moment in time for people when they walk in the door. And our only goal is that they're a little bit happier when they walk out than they were when they walked in. And that's it. I, I, that's it. That's all I got to do. Now, there's all ways that we could do that by moving the candy around and whatnot. So they're always... Things aren't in the same place. So there's always this journey of discovery that people go on when they come into the store because they got to look for their favorites again and they'll find something new. But that's but a business that's tactic tactical. as well. That's a yeah, business that, tactic. Yeah, that we kind of figured out that we do and it's fun. That um, yeah, that requires you though to be intuitive about what's going to create that a great experience. Yeah, and, and and some of it is, you know, one of the things I liked about the the model is that, you know, the merchandising and the product and a lot of that stuff was sort of already queued up, right? You, you didn't have to go build it from scratch. And that was a real appeal because there's a lot of things in the, our lives in the past where we were trying to build everything from scratch. And it's just hard to do in terms of putting the bandwidth into it. But 
the biggest challenges in that world, and I think this is really applicable to anybody that is trying to do a franchise or you know a, a business like that, is you got to get the right location, and you got to get the right manager, and you know in that way we hit home runs in both of those. And of, of all the things that you know, I take joy in. I think I'm most proud of Missy, the manager. That you know, I. I I'm proud that I got the right person because she's repeatedly proven herself to be the right person. And she's built a team of people that buy into the vision that I got her to buy in of just making people happy and having a beautiful store that is warm and welcoming and makes people happy. And so getting those two things right, um, one was a little more academic, right? The, the site selection was a little bit more follow the process and the methodology and make the math work in your favor. Picking Missy was intuition, you know, with, with some process, right? Some top grading and some questions and identifying and sorting yep. and filtering and whatnot. But at the end of the day, you know, I had a couple of really good candidates and it was my gut that went, Missy's the one. And all the things that my gut told me about Missy turned out to be true in far more ways than I even imagined. And, you know, there was a guy that I interviewed in, on my podcast uh, who said something that I've repeated multiple times. And that is, you know, when it comes to franchising, you know, one is an accident, two is a coincidence, three is a pattern. And so I'm really kind of excited by the creative challenge of getting a second location and to see if I could have a coincidence of success again. And then trying to create a pattern because it is a lot of fun to plant my candy orchard, right? That's what I call the whole rocket fizz thing is just little, you know, little locations of joy. But I think you've, you've found a formula for finding a site because you, you hopefully you're on the way to the, the next site, mm -hmm. uh, the team. And it's also a great way to leverage all the work you've done at object nine and all your experience there with, Branding, marketing, digital marketing, you know, yes. it's all the social media. You're allowed to. You can, I do you have a lot of advantages. <laughs> I have a lot of advantages that a lot of other franchise owners don't work with because, you know, John definitely handles all the digital marketing stuff with the stores or at least gets got it up and running. And then we taught some of our team members uh, how to do some of the stuff. But yeah, yeah, we definitely figured a lot of that out. But don't you think, Brandon, over over the course of Ob Object Nine, which is what twenty years old or thirty years old, thirty years 29, old, twenty nine, yeah, twenty yeah, twenty nine years old. But surely you've made a lot of people happy in creating a brand. Or and I know a lot of your work was refreshing brands and taking an old brand and making them sort of shiny for the for the modern day world. But but you've surely made a lot of people happy doing that. Well, you know, it's an older case study for us, but we definitely made a lot of uh, Pabst Blue Ribbon drinkers happy when we revitalized that brand. You know, there, there are some brands out there, but, you know, there's a, one of the things that's a little different about this one is that we make kids happy. Yeah. You know, a lot of the brands that we've worked on, just sort of the way the cards fell in our life were wine, beer, spirit brands, right? So by default in the U.S., it's 21 and older or 18 older globally. And then, you know, we ended up doing a lot of food and beverage brands that appealed to the 35 to 55 year old demographics and whatnot. And you get a little bit of that, you know, you certainly get the mom and grandma happiness going too in the store, but having a place that makes kids happy in a lot of ways takes me back to some time I spent with my grandfather. And yeah. I think that's kind of the root of a lot of this because my grandfather and I used to go have pastries together, go to get donuts. And that's as you know, my, my business card says pastry inspector, which is nicer than lover of donuts. <laughs> and there was a side of me that I always kind of thought I would do a donut shop because I know that that's kind of a place that makes kids happy. But I don't like the hours. <laughs> you know, the baker's hours are tough hours. And, you know, the candy store does a lot of the other things in a way that ties into some of the stuff that John's passionate about, which is the, you know, the anime and the comic books and the the sort of the Marvel cinematic or uh, you know, all those sort of pop culture zeitgeist stuff that he really likes and gets into both from an art perspective and a consumer perspective. And the candy stores turned out to be a really good 
kind of alignment around our passions for making people happy through the experience of candy uh, or sweets, um, but also making people happy through the joy of discovery of some of the, the art and cultural things and toys and stuff like that. That's been really fun. And so it's, it's, it's scratched some itches for both of us, which I think has helped make it even more powerful as a, as a company. Cause it's got our, it's got both of us creatively interested in it, which is good. Yeah. Because I could see you writing a book out of her, a story book for kids that's candy yeah. related. Um, and, yeah. and, and also, you know, I think you touched on it. You've done a lot of work with helping kids. You've taken your two sons through, you know, boy scouts, you spend a lot of your weekends, nights doing that. I mean, that's that's making people happy. Um, golf, you know, you in your own right uh, were a great golfer. You still have a great swing. Um, well, you know, I, I want to say, I, mean, I got and still do get more pleasure out of coaching golf at this point in my life than playing. Um, I, you know, I started coaching last year again. Um, a couple of different people. And it gives me a tremendous amount of joy to pass along that knowledge and that wisdom. In fact, I I'd rather coach than play uh, at this point. So, yeah, you know, and, that, and that's that, but that creates a mem- that, that, but that, that in its own way creates memorable experiences and, and, you know, you're leaving your legacy with them. Um, it, it's a memorable experience and music brand and something else. I mean, you know, you're, you're a man of, uh, very diverse uh, talents and skills. And I, the part that I had forgotten about today was, was the chemistry major. And, and, but, you know, in some ways that plays out in, in, um, in Rocket Fizz, you know, and understanding sort of the chemistry and the makeup of, uh, of, of all the candy um, people, you know, pe- we're, we're all in a way chemical human beings. <laughs> Um, well, it's building blocks for me, right? Because yeah. the part of the part of chemistry that I was really interested in was the synthesis side, right? Creating new compounds, and so it was. Uh, you know, there's sort of an interesting philosophical uh, comment that I was having with a uh, conversation I was having with a friend of mine about, you know, his take on we don't really create anything; we just synthesize things. Because uh, you know, he's a man of faith, and he's like, you know, every, all the, the palette has already been created by the creator, right? So. Our job is just to interpret what is out there and put it all together. And I think, you know, the candy store has been an interesting synthesis of, you know, wanting to create an amazing customer experience because that's ultimately what, you know, a brand is about. It's an experience. It's the promise. And then synthesizing all that I've learned through the years about how to identify talent and elevate it and give it free reign to be as good as it can be and empower that talent with the resources they need to be as successful as they can be. And then, you know, having something that, and I think this is more for my partner, but having something that's fun to play with where we get to do the marketing and some client isn't in there telling us what we have to do, or it's like, whatever we want to do, we could do just about. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of creative freedom that comes with that when you go into a project, knowing that, hey, if I can think it up, we could do it. And you don't always get that in marketing because there's always restrictions and limitations and, you know, editors and whatnot. And it's, there's a lot of things that kind of came together with that. It didn't even, I don't even think we realized it until we were in it. Because again, sort of that you just get into the moment and improvisation and start figuring it out. And then you certain things feel really good that you didn't even anticipate that come out of that improvisation. And um, that's why we want to do it again. And we're just curious to see, you know, can we replicate the elements of success? Yeah. And then enable it to happen right well it's and you can ultimately improvise. be down to that manager yeah you know you can improvise where you need to as long as you figure out those those key elements but yeah. i think that you know the great thing i've heard today brandon and you said it yourself is you know the sort of the building blocks of life is how you know your life started off with you know with chemistry and obviously there's some maths behind that uh, golf music you you figured out corporate life wasn't for you um like I did, I, I took a bit longer than you did, I think, to, to figure that one out. But, uh, you know, and then 
Uh, well, you were probably a better employee than I was. I was a terrible employee. I was a, I was an okay employee till <laughs> till till near the end, and then I was a shocking one. I think, but yeah. uh, I was a highly disruptive employee because I was always trying to innovate. Right at twenty five and twenty six, nobody wants to listen to a twenty five year old's ideas. So I was like, well, I have to go somewhere else because. I'm just not going to survive in corporate America. But then Object Nine's provided a great platform, and then you've you know you've come along to Rocket Biz, which is something that you know, as you say, it creates fun. You're, you're passionate about it. But you know, the, I think the thing I've really picked up today is, and I suppose I just want to sort of ask you as a, you know, as we start to wrap this up, Brandon, that do you think it's your creativity that's stronger, or or your intuition? You know, you're intuitive ability, your improvising ability is really strong, the stronger part of what's been making you successful. I would say it's intuition and, yeah. and, and you know, improvisation. Um, I don't think of myself as a, you know, creative person. I, fe- I feel like the people that are in my company and my wife in particular, like, you know, they're more creative by far than I am. Um But I do think I have a pretty good improvisational energy. And, you know, and and I think, oh, I don't know if this comes across the right way, but I I have a certain fearlessness about it. Like, I don't, you know, part of improvisation is you never say no, right? So you just go with it. And you have to have a certain freedom to fall on your ass. And I don't, you know, I'll just get back up, right? So, I think my intuition and improvisational skills coupled with, uh, well, hell, just get back up and go, uh, you know, has been, you know, more valuable to me through the years than, you know, maybe what someone might say is creativity or a more physically manifested creativity for sure. But I think the, the intuition enables the, you know, sort of in a way powers the improvisation is the way I would look at it. But, you know, to me, I take away from here really your identity and the way I look at identity, your X factor, in the way I've been hearing it, Brandon, is you know, your ability, your intuitive ability to 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 enable memorable experiences to be created. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what I've been sensing here. And and you can do that in many areas. In fact, you've done it in lots of areas. And I've been on the receiving end, luckily, of 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 some of those, whether it's in, you know, business help, uh, Golfing help. I can still remember one golf lesson you gave me uh, on the second hole at, at, at Country Club of the South in, in getting me to hit more of a half shot. Um, and, you know, there are a whole lot of reasons behind it, and I still do it today, you know. Um, like, hopefully that trajectory, a little technically. Baby. <laughs> control uh, that trajectory. Yeah, controlling the, controlling the trajectory. And I've had a bit more, you know, training on that and, and sort of compressing the ball. But... It, that day still stands out as a highlight to me because it actually steadied my golf game down a long way. And, and you know, I think that's a magic ability you have. You may not have known what you were doing with me, but I, I've always been an intent listener when, when, when I've been playing golf with you. Um, so, but I think that intuitive ability is amazing um, that you've got. So, so as we wrap up, Brandon, if you've got a tip that you'd like to sort of put out there for our listeners, it can be anything, a book to read, a movie to watch, podcast, a theory, anything you'd like to, to say. You know, I, um, I've read so many different books. It is kind of, you know, books are contextual to me, right? It's where, where you are in a certain journey is a book that's going to make a big difference. One thing I will say that I feel like has been really empowering to me as an entrepreneur. And it goes back to the beginning of EO. Um, and so I'll, I'll share that. Uh, I guess tip number one is if you're not a member of the entrepreneurs organization, you better become, I would check out EO network.org because having a peer group of business owners who can, especially now, you know, in this COVID experience, having that network of people who really understand what it's like to, buy in the marketplace and innovate and and ideate and and problem solve was unbelievably valuable and emotionally comforting. Yeah. So if you're an entrepreneur out there and you don't really have a peer group of people that can be where you can be vulnerable and open up and talk about stuff, I would encourage you to check out eonetwork.org. I think, you know, the other thing in, in, in speaking of why I mentioned that is one of the more transformational moments that I think has led to, you know, some key successes 
having an investing, if, if your business involves hiring people and being an EO for 16 years now or 17 years, you know, the problems are always people, <laughs> you know, everything else is usually fairly straightforward and solvable. The people problems are, are the ones that are most challenging. Having and investing in a methodology for hiring, right? How you identify, interview, and onboard people, and then you know align goals and expectations with incentives is the most valuable thing that I've, I think I've ever gotten out of the EO. Yeah. And it served me really well through the career. And so, you know, I use top rating as the, you know, the bastard version of that, uh, whether it was that or something else, I think investing in a really good methodology for hiring, because if you're not confident in that and you don't really have a good process, then you're probably missing out on some great opportunities to get good people and yeah. set the culture of your organization. Because that's no, where it starts. I, no, I think that's a, uh that's a good one for everyone to take on board. And, you know, there's lots of components to the hiring process. And I think you've got to look at it as a, not as a chore, but as an opportunity. And it's a process. It's a culture building thing. Um, and it's, it's not just talents, it's motivations as well. Yeah. And, and, you know, I use your tool um, and uh, you know, other people use other tools and whatnot, yep. but there is, you know, really understanding your organization and your vision of what you're trying to do. You know, I know I'm trying to make people happy. I'm not bringing people into that company who are highly introverted, you know, folks that want to sit in the back. I mean, you know, I need engaged, highly extroverted people that are excited about the candy, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, it, you know, but if I was hiring an account, building an accounting practice, it might be a very different methodology. So I think, having a strategy for the human development side of your business is so critical because the culture really does start with you setting that vision, but being able to flesh out that vision with the people to help realize it starts with having a methodology and a process and some tools to get it right. Yep. Well, I think that's a, that's a good tip. Thank you, Brandon. I've really enjoyed spending time with you today. All right. Thank you for having me on the show.